Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. My name is Martha Brown, and I am your volunteer with Dementia Friendly Fort Worth. We are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today's activities. Our topic today is presented by Peggy Spear with the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Her topic today is horses. Take it away, Peggy. So here we are. <laughs> Right now, uh, it's, it's February 28th, so I'm going to show you artworks that are on view currently. Some of them are from our collection, some of them aren't. But if you come to the museum before the 28th, you'll be able to see these beautiful artworks um, where they go back to their real homes. So Myth Makers, the premise of the show is um, looking at two uh, artists that are major artists in the canon of art history. We've got Winslow Homer, which some of you might be familiar with his work, and Frederick Remington. Winslow Homer was, um, he really focused on Civil War correspondence in the beginning of his career. And then he, um, so he was an illustrator to begin with. And then he started focusing on scenes of water, scenes of nature. Um, he was working in New York City and then eventually in Maine. So he's a New Englander. His works don't really feature any horses. So we're not gonna look at any of Homer's work today. We're gonna really focus on Remington's work. <laughs> how many of you have heard of Frederick Remington? Yeah. yeah. Everybody. He's a big man on campus here. So he's got all sorts of Remington. So we're really gonna focus on him and his artwork. But within the context of the show, uh, the curators were these artists because they really created this, um, through their art, they created this myth of Americana, of what America looked like during wartime, um, of what America looked like on the, on the coastline, what America looked like on, in the West. And they were New Yorkers through and through and through. So they were really just successful businessmen who were able to spin a story and a story that America ate up and not always necessarily telling it in a truthful way. So that's where that myth makers comes from. So <clears throat> without further ado, we're gonna look at our first horse. <clears throat> We've got this painting by uh, Remington. It's called the Stampede. So can you guys tell me what you see? Rain. 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 Lightning. Lightning. Mm -hmm. Speed. Speed, yes. What makes you say speed? Myra, was it you that said speed? Yes. What, what makes you say speed? Um, the angle of the horse's legs mm -hmm. and yeah. the cowboy's posture. Yep. And all the legs are off the ground. That's yes. Right. That is a wonderful observation. So both Myra and Martha hit on it. This was painted in 1909. About 10 years prior, a photographer, uh, Mybridge, Edward Mybridge, was creating these photographic series where he was um, set up a number of trips and flashes where something would move quickly and faster than the eye could catch, his film was able to catch it. So maybe you've seen this series of the horses, the, it's called um, Animal Locomotion. So he had a horse start running and through a series of trips and, and flashes and cameras, he was able to capture the speed of the motion of a horse. And so you can see, right, here, these two, these three frames, yes, yeah. all yeah. four of the horse's hooves come off the ground. Yep. Before, no one knew that because no one could catch it fast enough with their eye. So horses always looked like this yeah. when they were running really fast. It's called a hobby horse or a hobble horse or hobby horse, mm -hmm. that motion where all four legs are splayed out. But here you never see that. When all four horses' <laughs> legs are up, they're curled under the body, not extended from the body. So this was one of the first paintings that really accurately captured the motion of a horse's gallop. So like, you know, Martha noticed all four uh, hooves up and Myra said, you really felt that speed? Yes, you feel that, that quickness of the motion of the horse. 
and the posture, the, the balance the rider must have had to maintain um, safety when riding. So we talked about the rain, we talked about the lightning. What do you have a sense of maybe the sound you might hear or the, the commotion? What else do you feel when you're looking at this? Um, I don't know if these are cow or cows. It looks like they're the cattle, right? So, yeah, some cattle here, but you can see back here one other rider. Yes. So there's a sense of kind of maybe crisis happening, but he's not alone in the crisis. He's yeah. got maybe one other one other rider where you think they might be yelling at each other or the horses might be, this horse might be a little spooked. They're scared of the lightning and the thunder and the rain. And they're yeah, trying yeah. to stampede. So these two guys are trying to keep them from stampeding. Yeah. Well, it looks like yeah. the stampede's on effect. Maybe they're trying to turn it so that uh, they can stop the, the stampede. But yeah, you're right. They're both on that same side of the, of the stampede, maybe trying to push it one way. Mm -hmm. So this, is, um, this was painted in, in 1908. <coughs> uh, Remington died in 1909. Oh. And, and towards the end of his, well, he, and he died, um, suddenly he died of an appendicitis. So this wasn't, oh. he knew his time was coming. This was um, later in his career, but he didn't know it was later in his, or, you know, the twilight of his career until you know, looking back. And so he painted a lot of nocturnes, these nighttime paintings. And, he's, and it was this, his time in his life when he was really thinking, when his Artwork shifted to really a, like a psychological um, reflection versus when he was an illustrator and he was reporting and recording things that he might have seen. So knowing that this was towards a, you know the end of his career and kind of the end of his popularity in those westerns that he was once creating, it, you kind of see it in a different light. <coughs> really interested in this idea of um, man versus nature. And so what do you see here that kind of speaks to that narrative of man versus nature? You can see the front moving in. Yeah, the front moving in. Yeah, because yeah, there's a, there's, there's a patch of looks like either clouds or white clouds or, or sky over here on the side. Yeah. If the sky's dark enough, you can't tell which is which. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and then this lightning. Yeah. And then there's this one or two, but really the focus is this one rider and you don't know what's gonna happen. Is, is he gonna, you know, it's mid action, he's mid gallop, mid crack of lightning, which you know how instantaneously that happens. Remington was just phenomenal at catching a scene in the middle of the, the height of action where you don't always know what the outcome is gonna be. And so what he did too is that rain, and if you were to see it in, um, in real life, after he painted the original scene, he went back over with a very thin, thin, thin green layer to create the sheets of rain, but creating mm. the sheets of rain mid lightning <coughs> strike. And you know that kind of eerie green, that Mm -hmm. Sky lights up when you when lightning strikes. So he's able to capture that in this painting. That's a tornadic color, isn't it? That's right. I was gonna say mm -hmm. that, that, that that's the color of clouds before or tornado or or, or hail comes. Mm -hmm. Or hail, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that the, 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 the hail, hmm? uh, Peggy. I noticed that the uh, horse that the rider's on the uh, here looks like he's extremely excited because his eyes wide open and his mouth's open. Mm -hmm. So he's got a bit. Well, yeah, but it's, he's breathing hard. Yeah. Right? But in the eyes wide open, I, you know, horses, horses have, you know, big eyes, but uh, <laughs> they, they, they also uh, get it pro probably when they're excited, they, they, their, their eyes get spooked. Yeah. And, and this is one of those things where, you know, that you noticed, um, his face, yeah, there's a bit in his mouth, nostrils are flaring. He's probably tall and bun, so breathing hard. 
Yeah, then his ears are pinned back too, which yeah. um, a, a sign of a horse being spooked, but it's also what happens when the horse is in full gallop, which you can see um, the, like here, you can't even oh, see yeah. the ears sticking up. You're assuming the ears have been pinned back. So I think all of those things you, that you hit on are he's okay. out of breath, he's spooked, and who knows what's gonna happen next. Do they get out of the rain? Do they lose cattle? Do they lose control of the cattle? Who knows? Hey, do you suppose that horse ever bit the bit? <laughs> I don't, you know? I, you know, he, he's got plenty of um, paintings where horse uh, tack has gone awry, so you never know. <laughs> Just ask. So here is another horse. Uh, depiction, but it's very different than, it's not very different, it's a very different medium. What are we, what are we looking at here? Bronze. Bronze cast. Filter, yeah. Bronze cast. What else do we see, uh, or what do we see happening in this cast? The horse is running, and the, the Indian looks like he's looking to a direction. He's also whipping the horse. Yeah, you see his junk straps got in bed. He's running, we noticed he's running. Yep. Kind of that full gallop because you can, if you can notice, this is hard. It's hard doing sculpture on a screen just because you're supposed to see it in the round. All four hooves are off the ground. Yes. Again, that full gallop. You got the flared nostril. His tail's out gallop. like the other picture. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So either wind or a speed or both. Yeah, but to me, it, it, it feels like he is, again, that mid-action. His horse is mid-gallop. We don't know if he's running from someone, if he's running towards someone or something. You know, we don't, it's for us to kind of speculate what's happening in the middle of the scene. And so this was made in 1909 in the last, or excuse me, 1901. In the last 14 years of his career, uh, he made, or I I'm, I'm, might be inverting the numbers. Yeah, in the last uh, 14 years of his career, he made 24 sculptures. He was not a sculptor his entire life. And um, it was almost a friend kind of dared him, why don't you try doing something um, 3D? And he ended up creating some really beautiful sculptures. In fact, the Bronco Buster, which is one of his most famous um, sculptures, is in the, the Oval Office and has been for almost as long as that this uh, that sculpture has existed. So there was something he really spoke to in the American interest because these all sold through Tiffany's, the um, the jewelry and fine goods retail retailer. This sold through Tiffany. So you know anybody who could afford it could buy themselves a, a Remington. And so um, this was, this particular bronze that's in the exhibition <clears throat> is the number six cast of 21 that were made while he was alive, a lifetime cast. A lot of casts of some of his other sculptures were made posthumously under the direction of his wife, but this happened to be cast while he was alive. And so what's really cool here, he used, or is anybody a sculptor? No. No. Is what? Well, um, no. He so he um, he started off. There are two different methods when you're using uh, metal that you could do, either lost wax or sand cast. And lost wax is what he used here. He started off using sand cast, which is, a, is an easier technique to use. And it uh, he switched then to lost wax, which without getting into the technicality of it, it allows the artist to go back in. And, and incorporate really beautiful detail that sand wax wouldn't allow you to do. Oh, okay. When he would use lost wax, he would go back in and say, can you maybe point out some of the detail that um, might seem like something we would add in after the fact? Interesting. Hmm. So where is this piece store, uh, on, on display? Is it... Uh, is it in Washington or? No, this cast is actually in, in um, the exhibition right now. This is our cast. Oh, it's yours. Oh, oh it's the it's museum's, ours. okay. Um, 
Yeah, and we have, I think we have two versions of it, if I'm correct. Um, and the, the, the sculpture, sometimes we have um, a lost wax version and a sand wax version, and we'll often put, a lot of museums in the country will put the two different versions side by side, so you can oh. see the type of difference from one casting method to another. And with the sand, with the lost wax, which is what we're seeing here, you'll be able to see things like, look at the muscular, the rippling yeah. muscles in the horse. Yeah. You don't see that in the, in the lost, in the sand cast. Or um, the individual hairs of the rider, of the mane, the way that the, the tail is flying up, um, the feather, the details in the feather on the rider's uh, headpiece. <laughs> Those are all details that he can go in and really meticulously add which um, give it a very different um, flavor than other other um, versions of the cast that were done with sand cast. And so here too, which is, uh, this is really difficult to do. The horse is completely off air, but he's using this buffalo pelt. It's sliding off the horse, but what it, what it's doing is it's connecting the horse to the base oh. of the culture. So that's a... Um, that's an artistic technique and method that he got really good at doing. And again, like I think it was Myra said, it feels like the other painting where it's a lot of motion, it's a lot of yes. drama. Wow, okay. And so when I saw this, when I see this sculpture, um, it reminds me, we have a partner in the community who's a barrel racer and he sent me one of his videos of him barrel racing. And so you kind of get that same sense, I'm gonna play for you guys, the same sense of this quickness, speed, perfect balance that um, you have to have. I'm Ben McDonald and I'm a barrel racer. Barrel racing is a talk. timed event in which competitors run around three barrels trying to get the fastest time possible. This event is a speed event, so there has to be a lot of trust between myself and my horse so that we can make the perfect team. Because of the nature of the speed, there's a lot that goes into this and a lot of equipment that must be required, including a saddle and reins. Making sure your saddle is tight and that you have the correct headgear is crucial to turning all three barrels. So he's riding, I'm gonna show you the video. He's riding with a helmet and the, you know, the technology now with horse protection. But when you look back and you think of, oh my goodness, he's essentially bareback. <coughs> he's not even holding on to the reins here. Yeah. No, he's not. Strong legs. So here's, I know. <laughs> I wonder if the horse enjoys this. Probably, otherwise he wouldn't run fast. <laughs> He's running fast to get away from it all. I know. <laughs> so, you know, totally different. This is, you know, a, a, an Indian, that American Indian that might be in battle. Um, you had, he has a shield on his back. He has a spear in his hand. Very different than the recreational barrel racing, but you get that sense of speed and quickness and talent it takes for a rider to stay on the back of a horse. So anyway, so this is very true to Remington. And now we'll move to another artwork that's on view in this exhibition right now. Um, titled Aiding a Comrade Past All Surgery. And this is another one that's been loaned to us from Houston. Ooh, ouch. So it's not in our collection. And it's um, quite a treat to see this in real life. This is one that's often in our history books. So what do we see here? Uh, I see a rider that's fallen off his horse. That's right. And the foot is still in the... Foot, foot's in, in, in the, the stirrup. stirrup. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Battle in the background with weapons. Yes. You see a battle. Yeah. The Indians. And yet, did you say Indians? Yeah. Uh, to me, it looks the one there in the middle that you're pointing at right mm -hmm. now looks like. But I don't know. It's so small. No, you're, you're right. It's, and this painting, Don, I'm talking to you, this painting um, 
is pretty massive. We have it on one wall, back of one wall that stands in the middle. It's probably um, maybe like three feet by two feet. Oh, okay. Big. Maybe even bigger than that. Wow. Um, but this, it, you would be able to see it is an American Indian. And how did you, why, what made you think it was an American Indian, Yetta? A headdress. A headdress. Mm -hmm. And so this must be noted, this is part of the, um, the myth making that Remington, it's pointed out in the exhibition. Remington um, would paint these back in his studio in New York. He would not be on site painting these things. He maybe never witnessed any situation like this at all. This is all kind of him recreating this image of the West. He would take American Indian um, tack, horse tack, headdresses, clothing, whatever, and he would use that, let's say, chaps, and he would use those chaps for every American Indian, regardless of the nation it was from. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a real misappropriation of clothing, of um, markings, awesome. of headdress that he kind of just blanket used for a lot of different nations, which um, is inaccurate. So that it's contributing to this myth that all American Indians would wear a, a feathered headdress when in battle, when that wasn't necessarily yeah. true. So um, that's just a little caveat whenever you're looking at Remington's artwork. Um, he doesn't necessarily treat American Indians as less than, they're more just a, a different and exotic type of person, not necessarily an equal person to the white rider. So, you know, with, with Black Lives Movement and things like that and a real focus on giving everybody equal voicing, that's just something that we do address in the exhibition as this was common of the time, it might not have been right, but this was what was happening in the United States. So you'll notice that kind of theme throughout his artwork. So is this, this, this is the note that says past all surgery mean that this guy is not going to survive? That's a word to assume. Because wow. right now in the scene, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? And it's that middle of the moment. We have no idea. Is, is he going to be okay? Is he not? What do you, what do you think is going to happen? It's gonna get kicked by the horse. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the uh, brown one or the or the black one or the like chestnut. Brown one. one. The brown one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Close to his head. Yeah. Yeah. No, that horse has already passed him. <sighs> oh. But he could still kick button? backwards when the next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see that they're trying to help him, or at least, and this is also another artistic method. He's framing the situation using the horses. He's got, you know, his horses all lined up to frame this man. But we don't know if, if this horse is gonna, you know, it's starting to rear, how is it gonna land? Is it gonna buck? We have no clue. So you're really, you're, you're feeling the suspense, but like Don pointed out, the title would suggest this poor man does not make it. Yeah. So, uh, was one guy is trying to get the control of the horse? Yes. 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 Yeah, which is really, you really feel like you're in this, this drama. On top of another drama that's playing out behind you. So there's, you know, another sense of urgency that's yeah. going on. Uh, so... My, my question is, is that they're, they're riding like this, they're trying to stop his horse, but it looks like the Indians are chasing them. Some of the Indians are chasing them. And, uh, well, I think the Indians are, are, some are chasing and some are shooting at others. Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. But are they going to stop their horses and try to pick him up or they, the Indians will catch up with him, I guess. They'll have another fight. Your guess is as good as ours, you know? Okay. And that's what's so that's what um, was so appealing to American audiences when these were made because this was uh, and this is not what the West looked like at this time. So this is also creating another myth of in the late 1800. I mean, things were pretty settled. Reservations had already started to be established. So this is this is a, a scene that America loved because you didn't know how it was going to play out felt the tension, but 
you, it's up to you to complete, you know, how this, how this plays out. But here he's really good at capturing, does this feel like a, a windy day, a hot day, a sunny day? What kind of, are you able to kind of pick up on maybe <clears throat> the atmosphere? Well, <laughs> sunny. Sunny. Dusty. Sunny, dusty, dry. Dry, yeah. Probably, probably hot. Probably hot summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't all have coats on. He does, but he's, they've got that light, well, uh, you know, billowy shirts or hats would indicate, you know, it's a cooler time of year or a warmer time of year, the white. But yeah, he, um, he was using shorter stroke, you can see. Yeah. When you're, when you're looking at the painting in real life, they're very visible, but to kind of create this, you know, this um, French, he's starting to be influenced by French Impressionism. So he, he's changing his brush strokes. He's trying to include the shimmer. You know, if you think of any sort of Monet or um, Manet, there's that hotness or, you know, that brightness, that shimmer that often comes through with Impressionism. He's starting to try to experiment or integrate those types of techniques. It's hard to believe you can do that with paint, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting. This we're going to look at our last horse um, artwork. This is a not a great reproduction of it, um, but it's the best we had. So, but Frederick Remington started as an illustrator. He did things for Harper's Weekly, Collier's. He was um, doing course war correspondence down in, Mex in Texas, Mexico during those wars and things like that. And then the, the more and more he um, progressed in his career, he was then a sculptor and he really wanted to be a fine art painter. And so I think it was in 1908, he started burning old work he had done when he was an illustrator because he wanted to just completely live, leave that artistic life behind him. Luckily, a neighbor stopped him mid-fire and was able to rescue some of his work. Ooh. But it, he was really, this is, you know, the painting we started with of the rider in the thunderstorm. That was 1908. This painting is one of his last paintings before he um, passed away on, I think it was Christmas Day that year. He was, he really started to come into his own as a fine artist. And so what here feels very different than what we've seen here? More tranquil. More tranquil, More tranquil. Yes. Look, looks like, I don't know if that's this, the teepees are by water or if that's just a, a shadow, I guess, of the teepees. Yeah, yeah. More realistic Indian. You think it's yeah. a more realistic Indian, okay. Right, what because it that? doesn't have the headdress and, you know, that Remington was very famous for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the details of this um, American Indian are, are kind of blurred. We don't really know what's around his waist. You know, it's probably a, a blanket of some sort. His horse doesn't have seem to have any sort of regalia on him. Um, the, the saddle looks very simple. I got to tell you that this is at the um, the West Point collection. My husband graduated from West Point. I wonder if he's seen this. Oh, really? Oh, how cool. Yeah, what's wow. interesting, this title. I took a so picture so I could show it to him later. Hey. Yeah, it, okay, so give it, you can Google it. And it's um, right now on, I think it's Portland's Museum, or Portland Museum of Art's website. You can do a virtual tour. But what's interesting, when I was in graduate school, however many years ago now, that was 15 years ago, this artwork had a different title. Oh, really? The, um, let me find it. It was something like, it used to be called uh, Indian Horse and Village, and now it's Sunset on the Plains. So there's been some more research on it um, for, the, um, for art historians to more appropriately name it. But the Sunset on the Plains, that title speaks a little more to maybe the psychological um, story that's at play. What what does that make you think? Sunset. That's evening. Evening. 
Because the art, the uh, American Indian backs to us, what, what do those together kind of indicate to you? Sky is kind of red. Yep. Yeah, twilight. It looks like it's twilight at night. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so yeah. it, it. Oh, go ahead. I I I I've decided that that's what the what this is is, is a a river or a creek because the horse looks like he's drinking out of it. I think you're right. Oh, good seat, Don. Well, and yeah, even well, though even though he didn't know he was going to die, it looked very much like the end of his life. He's reflecting on the end of his life, the sunset yeah. of his years. A right. lot of art historians feel um, the title, and this was happening too with some of the artworks that were produced before, right around this time. Mm -hmm. It felt like the sunset, like an elegy um, for America, the American West. Uh, you know, by 1909, mm -hmm. yeah. reser the reservations were everywhere. You did not see American Indians like this kind of roaming um, the wild west the way that they had once been portrayed. The back you know, his back to us, basically riding off into the sunset. I mean, it's, it's the end of an era for the United States. It was the end of the era for an American Indian. And yeah. it was the end of an era as it came to be for um, Remington. Yeah. So it was deeply psychological. This feels more emotional per se than something like this. This feels high drama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this feels more reflective. But maybe other people feel differently. I think well, you hit I the nail on the head. You think what? I think you hit the nail on the head. This feels 3D almost, and the other one feels one dimensional. Myra, that's a great observation. So he's still kind of in this uh, illustration mode. Yes. And then you're right, he starts to shift, <laughs> and so everything's hard lines here. You see that blurriness, yes, a fading of lines that totally changes. Like you said, it gives you more um, atmospheric depth. Well, my friends, these are our, our horses of the day. They will be on view through the end of this, um, this one. February. This, this particular one is ours and will be on view whenever you come. But um, I really, if you can and are looking for an outing, everything is socially distanced here. It's all, you know, we only have like maybe 40 people in the museum throughout the whole day. So it's a safe place. But um, some of these artworks are really cool because they're the ones that you see in textbooks and they don't really ever get to travel. So it's, it's pretty neat to see some of these. That one with the uh, Indian full gallop, he's, it looks to me like maybe he's hunting because he's looking down. Maybe he's chasing a deer or a buffalo. Yeah, uh, that's what I thought too. Uh, Excellent. Uh, Try to. You uh, would have been. What a good thought. Yeah. Yeah, and that spear looks pretty. It gives you that distance to end up spearing something if you're coming at it. You're right. I know I've told you this before, but my grandfather was a guard at the St. Louis Art Museum. I'm sure he saw his fair share of Remingtons and Russell. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, the whole building itself was built for the World's Fair that was held in St. Louis. That's right. So he it's a really stunning a building. Have you been before? You got to guard the mummies. Make sure <laughs> that they wouldn't run away. I love it. <laughs> Well, friends, it was good seeing you all. Um, good seeing you too. I will see you next week. I think it's children. <laughs> oh, I hope it's children. It's a surprise for everyone. Um, We're going to say it's children. And if you come up with something else, that'll be fine too. We just love having you here, Miss Peggy. Oh, you're sweet. You know, you guys are so fun to talk to. So I'm glad you're you're here today. I hope you enjoy watching any of the inauguration if you can. And um, we'll see you all next week. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. My gracious, that was wonderful, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Yeah. 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 And have you ever been at the other Sid Richardson Museum? Yes, I have. Downtown, there's a lot of Remington and yes. the Charles, whatever his last name is. R Russell. Remington Russell. And Russell. Yes, that's a wonderful museum too.
that would be a good one to repeat a visit. I think uh, Friday folks went there not too long ago. Yes, we did. Yes, we, yes, yeah, we, we did. did. Just I, think it's I think it's closed right now, though. Could oh. be. Well, oh, so it's not so big. No, it's not. It's easy to get around in when it's open. Mm -hmm. So for tomorrow, we have Mind Fit with Dave Parks. And he's going to stretch our idea of what we can think. To oh, good luck to him. We look forward. To <laughs> we look forward to Dave. <laughs> yeah, we will be singing again tomorrow. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad we're not doing cookies. Also. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'll be singing tomorrow, Paulette. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure. I love to sing. <laughs> okay. Other Paulette. The other oh, other Paulette. Okay, hey. Yes. We have a Lubbock Paulette and a St. Louis Paulette. We do? Where's the St. Louis Paulette? She's in the black shirt with her hand raised. There is hey, I used to, we used to live in Lubbock. Well, good. That's where I used to live. Lubbock. We lived in Lubbock for a long time. I did too. 16 10th Street in Lubbock. Oh, my. Wow. I lived on 37th Street in there Lubbock. You go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, I mean, you still one thing about the, the streets in Lubbock, they were in numerical order or alphabetical order. Yeah. So you could always kind of figure out where you were. Exactly. It was easy. That was good. <laughs> yeah. Got the slide road. Slide road. Yeah. Uh, Don, you were going to say something? Yeah, uh, my computer seems to be frozen. I just wondered if you could see, still see and hear me. I yeah, yeah. 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 We're moving. We're yeah, good now. Your lips are moving. Well, well so weird. That's that's weird. Okay, so I'm gonna have to get out. I'm probably gonna have to uh, figure a way to get out and get back on for the for the Fifth Street Cafe stuff. Um, Gail's on mute. Yeah. I go on Fifth Street today. So we transitioned oh. from this meeting to Fifth Street Cafe in just a few minutes. So Dawn, if you want to go out and come back in, we'll be here when you get back. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to leave. I don't know if Hans wants to I'm stay. Leaving. Okay. Bye. We'll be back. Bye, folks. Going to see you tomorrow. Okay. All right. We Bye. will. Bye. 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 Bye.